to see we'll, we'll have these video conferences frequently and pretty much whenever you want if you say i'm confused i don't know what to do and we can have a video conference either just me and you or i can say i'm video conferencing with somebody about this topic does anybody else want to join in and i'll let you know and so we can do this um, pretty pretty easily and it, it works pretty well so um, that way, you know, we can talk as, as, I don't know if this is face to face, but at least it's a little more personal, right? Um, um, yeah. So for week one, would we like to answer the, sorry. So we're gonna read chapter one and the other readings, and then we're gonna uh, do the discussion, and that's for this week, the first week, right? Right. That's so this, I'm gonna move this, uh, I just spin it to September 3rd. So this is, so that's what you're gonna do the first week, is just participate in the discussion, okay? That's the first week. You're gonna just participate in the discussions. So, um, yeah, you should try to read it before you engage in the discussion because it'll be a more informed discussion after you read it. And I can usually tell when somebody didn't do the reading and participated in the discussion <laughs> because they're, they're going like, yeah, I agree with him. Yeah, I think the Giants are going to win this year. You know, so, um, you know, the, um, after you've done the reading, then you'll understand what they're talking about and can make an informed uh, discussion point. So are we clear, people online, about, about how the discussions work? So um, there will be a lot of videos, and I'll be adding more as I find cool stuff or things that are related to the course. I'll be putting it in like, did anyone see the Calle Trece? Nope. So, this is a important video because it, it talks about this, this issue, about this topic, right? And um, I had something to do with this. So um, before we go any further, so any questions about the website? About the website, of how it works? This is basically how it works. You do the uh, readings, you do the, uh, the discussions, and you turn in, um, so here's the first assignment. So you're gonna do this assignment, and you just, uh, we're looking at this as the instructor, but you just upload your assignment, or there's a text box you can type in there. So is that clear? Yeah? So what I'm asking you to do on, on the assignments is try to be as precise as possible. And what you're gonna hear from me all the time is examples, historical context, references, don't be vague. Because what, Again, this is an online class. If it was a face-to-face -face class, it would be a little different where I'd kind of get to know people and, uh, you know, kind of where you're coming from. But here we are, we're far away, and you need to show me that you know, right? That, that you know this, and this is part of the exercise here, is to practice your writing skills, make a convincing argument. And how do you make a convincing argument? Is you cite examples, you use references, and you, you base your argument on something on historical, on a historical context that you're citing. So what happens is because of the historical injustices and all the things we're gonna be read about, massacres, genocide, all of these people are, people get upset. About six months and six weeks into the class, people are really upset because they're just reading about horrible things over and over and all the dictatorships and, and genocide, all these things happening, and they get really emotional. And I get these essays, you know, that are very emotional, but they forget to cite 
arguments and context and they're just like, oh, you know, these dictators and, you know, U.S. intervention and we should do this and let's march in the, you know, okay, that's great, but uh, this is a history class, so let's try to, to make arguments based on historical context and we're not judging these things, right? We're not judging people. So again, people lash out, oh, those communists and blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's try to be impartial. Like, what were they trying to do? What were they doing at the time? Let's, let's not get into these, these um, political polemics. And, and, and I will um, try to be very understanding, uh, but I'm going to make you do it again. If you, if, you, if you give me the political diatribe, I'm going to say, okay, wait a minute. Drink some cold water and <laughs> try it again. So, um, so this is how it's going to work. It's very straightforward. There's, I'm not trying to trick you at all. There's no trickery involved in this class. There's no trick answers. There's no, um, you know, I know some, some professors like to do that, but I, I don't. I just make it really straightforward. What it is, is, is right here. So what I'm going to ask you to do, because it's very simple and straightforward, I'm asking you for the same thing. I'm asking you to, to don't be lazy. Try to proofread your work, reread it. If you have trouble writing, um, can you show the textbook? Uh, if you have trouble writing, you might want to see a writing tutor. Uh, you might want to proofread your work before you turn it in, and this is commonly a mistake people make. Uh, for instance, people that have trouble with, with, with English, sometimes if you read it out loud, your own writing, and you read it out loud to yourself, you'll hear your own mistakes, because you're, you're used to hearing it. Sometimes you'll look at it and you go, oh, that looks perfect. And then you read it out loud and, and you realize, oh, wait a minute, I made a mistake. So this, since these aren't, none of these are long assignments, you can, you can do this. Uh, the textbooks. Here's the main textbook, Modern Latin America. The other book is, is an e-book that's online, Dancing with Dynamite. So, uh, any questions about, about the site? Is the book free? No. No. <laughs> Uh, that's a good question. There's a lot of discussion. Yeah, it's at the bookstore here, the City College bookstore. It's on Amazon. It's probably on eBay. It's probably... Yeah, so the, 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 the uh, yeah, the, the prices vary depending on where you get it. There are used copies and there's copies on, on reserve at the library here. Yeah, there's copies on reserve. And I haven't seen it as an ebook. I don't think it's, most of these textbooks aren't ebooks because they're afraid the students are going to pirate it. So they haven't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Do I accept the Latin Do I accept late assignments? Um, in theory, no. In <laughs> practice, if you can tell, like, tell me, um, I need an extension on the assignment. That's as much, as much as you need to say. I don't need to hear the reasoning why, and I'll say yes. But um, because the courses are audited by the state, if you, and all your communication with me, email communication should be through the site. There's an, e there's an inbox here, and you can send me communication. And you say, I need an extension, and I say yes. I don't need to hear the reason why, and I'm not going to judge you, and that's all you need to say. And that you've covered me to give you an extension, and then when it's late. Because uh, yeah, as you know, City College is frequently audited for all kinds of reasons, and they do look at these classes. So if they see things that are abnormal, then the whole thing's in question. So I have to be very careful about it. So late assignments, no. But if you're going to turn it in late and you ask for an extension, then it's not late. Is it, am I clear? Yeah. I can't say, yeah, turn it in late. But I can say I will give you an extension pretty much automatically. So is that clear, the distinction?
Um, so, uh, any other questions? I see someone, the, the, the subject is a 700 page document. Um, no, just the first part of it, not the 700 pages. So, um, any other questions about the readings, about how the site works? So I think it's very straightforward. You read, you discuss, you turn in the assignment. Uh, uh huh. So are all the are on Sunday? They're all due on Sunday at midnight. What do you mean? The assignments are all available. Everything is here at any time. Well, but you could do that. I don't recommend it. I know. I'm just asking. Because I took another online class and a lot of things were like until. Right. No, no. It's all here. It's all here. And like I said, I'm not trying to trick you. You can see it all here so you can plan your time and resources, etc. But if there's people that turn in all the assignments the first day. I might be a little suspicious about how you did that. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, not a good idea. Sunday at midnight. Yeah. So at 1159 PM on Sundays, just so we're clear. So, um, any other questions? All right. Um, what we'll be doing is, um, We'll be having video conferences and I'll schedule video conferences uh, at different moments when assignments are due mostly so we can talk about the assignments. And I'm going to usually do these on Saturday mornings. Now, if we can, if you can tell me that enough people are not free on Saturday mornings and we should do it some other time, then we can do that. But I found that Saturday mornings are usually a good time. Yeah. So anyway, we'll we'll figure it out. So we could do since we have a, an audience here, and today is Tuesday, and you're here. Is Tuesday a good day? The problem is Tuesday is too close is is too far away from the assignment. It should be closer. Like probably third Friday, you're probably out <laughs> partying and. Uh, but uh, Thursday, maybe Thursday at seven o'clock, is that a good time? Thursday. So, well, Saturday morning is good. Saturday morning is really good because the assignment's due on Sunday. So, and by then you've probably done enough of the reading. And so um, I think Saturday, uh, Okay, I'll, I could do a, a doodle poll, but it, it's, it kind of doesn't work because a lot of the people, there's uh, like 15 people here and there's five people here. What about the other 30 people that aren't here? Which means this is not a good time for them. Or, I don't know, they're watching Game of Thrones or whatever, whatever they're doing. So it's hard to say. So we'll, 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 we'll go by year. Now, let's say we do it on Saturday and you, you need help. All you do is you write to me, I need some help, can you give me some guidance, and we'll have a, you know, a little discussion specifically about what you need, so I don't have to explain it to everybody, okay? And I'm pretty accessible. Um, I have it on my phone, I have the, the app on my phone, and I'm around, so, and, and I'm usually pretty accessible to you. And let's say you're like, oh, I don't know what to do, I'm so confused, then what do you do? You say, I need an extension, and we'll take a couple and we'll talk about it okay or you'll say you know uh, this is what i'm thinking am i on track or not we can talk about it so i want you to succeed and i'm going to do everything i can to help you do that sometimes online classes are tough and um let me tell you who i am and why i'm teaching this class which will kind of give some of the so will these video conferences be recorded um I'm going to do my best. Um, for instance, I'm recording this one, but it looks horrible, and I don't know if it'd even be worth watching. Uh, but anyway, I'll do my best. 
and I'll post them up there in the same link where the where the uh, video conference is I'll say recording of video conference it sometimes doesn't work at seven times it doesn't doesn't uh, last night I did one for um, for my Diego Rivera class and I was just at the end and uh, the student that was holding the computer for me dropped it and that was the end <laughs> it didn't record <laughs> so anyway I'll do my best so uh, somebody has a question what assignment you talking about <laughs> I yes no assignment due this Sunday besides discussion all right <laughs> Anyway, I kind of, yeah, yeah, all right. So uh, I'm talking about assignments that are generally due on Sundays, and there's no assignment due this, this Sunday. So um, let me just tell you, uh-huh. Are there um, in-class midterms and finals? No, no. Uh, it says that in the class yeah, schedule, right. but it's something that I, that I didn't put in there. And I used to do that because it was a requirement. Um, but the problem was people are taking the online class yeah. because you're busy, because you can't be here, right? It's not because you don't want to be here, uh, but you, you can't be here. So I, I understand that. So I took out that requirement, okay? So, um, but it says that in the class schedule and uh, it's just the, to change the wording in the class schedules beyond my power, I can't do it. So I just explain it to people. Um, so uh, and I'm, I'm just going to explain to you who I am so you can see where I'm coming from and why I'm teaching this class. Um, Okay, I'm confused, so that it's easy. All right, so um, can you turn off your microphone? Somebody's buzzing out there. Thank you. So you're confused. So the two-page essays due on September 3rd, not on, sorry, not, can this come Yeah, that was Sunday too, but not Right, it's not, it's due on yeah. the 3rd. It was a mistake and I fixed it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, to, to give you more time, and um, usually I would have the assignment due on the first week, but um, I decided to give more time so that people could have time to get the books and to get, because we're not as, the, the way that the, the weeks are this semester, uh, we're not in such a rush. There's an extra week for some, I guess there's one less holiday or, or something. So um, anyway, um, I, grew up here in San Francisco. Um, my parents, my father uh, was a documentary filmmaker, Saul Landau, and you'll see some of his films in the course. Uh, he made over 50 documentary films and about 35 of them in Latin America. And my mother, Nina Serrano, is, is a Latina poet and community activist uh, who was one of the founders of the Mission Cultural Center and very active here in the San Francisco Mission District, and she still is. She's 83 and still very active. So um, I first uh, had my first visit to Latin America. It was in 1960. I was five years old when I went to Cuba. Uh, shortly after the revolution, uh, my parents were students and wanted to see what was going on, and we went to Cuba and stayed there for four months in 1960. Uh, but I was only five, so I don't remember very much about it. But I did meet people in Cuba in 1960 that I still know today. So um, I uh, began um, knowing about Latin America from a very early age. And uh, my mother's family is from Colombia. And, uh, but, but we lived in New York. Um, so I knew more about the Latin side of New York. And, and then we moved to San Francisco in 1961. And uh, I lived here in the Mission District 
where I grew up. And in 1968, I uh, went back to Cuba, uh, where I studied there for a year. My father was um, directing a documentary film about Fidel Castro that you're, you'll be able to see in this, in this course um, that he made in 1968. And I was uh, in, the, in the boarding school there, in the National Art School, for a year. So I learned about Cuba and the educational system uh, on a firsthand basis. Um, and later I, I came back to um, San Francisco and uh, went to Mission High School and started playing music and was involved in, in music groups here and playing guitar and involved in a lot of community activism that was going on in the 1970s in San Francisco uh, against the Vietnam War, um, in support of a lot of the guerrilla movements that were happening in, in Central America and El Salvador and Nicaragua. And um, I was involved in a lot of the, uh, the neighborhood politics in the mission. And there was a lot of um, constantly marches and protests and, and discussions. And, and, uh, and I began working as a, a musician and working in nightclubs, uh, playing in, in Latin bands. And uh, in uh, 1978, I, I was at UC Berkeley, was studying uh, at UC Berkeley. And I, my best friend from the neighborhood who was studying there with me, decided that he couldn't stay in school anymore. And he went to go fight in Nicaragua with the guerrillas, as did 200 other people from San Francisco, a brigade of people, mainly union leaders, students, et cetera, from, from the mission mostly, went to go fight with the guerrillas in, in Nicaragua. And in 1979, I graduated from UC Berkeley in June uh, 1979. And July 19th, 1979, the Sandinistas marched into Managua, um, a victorious guerrilla movement. They defeated the, the Somoza government. And um, a month later, or no, actually, no, a few days later, I got a telegram. And a telegram is like an email on paper that someone delivers to you. Uh, inviting me to work in the newly founded Ministry of Culture. I just graduated in Latin American Studies and Sociology from UC Berkeley, and a lot of my friends were in Nicaragua uh, involved in this, and so I, I was invited to go work there with Ernesto Cardinal, who is the Minister of Culture, who is a liberation theology priest, who you're going to read about in this class, a very influential figure, a poet, and one of the proponents of liberation theology. And I ended up staying there for uh, almost 10 years, uh, working in the Ministry of Culture in the Artists Association. Uh, I produced a radio show on Radio Sandino and began working with a, a music group called uh, Luis Enrique Mejia Godoy and Manco Tal. And uh, with them began touring all over Latin America and visited almost every country in Latin America. Um, went to Argentina twice, Uruguay twice, Brazil four times, Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, uh, Bolivia, um, all through Central America, Mexico 20 times, Cuba many, many times. So um, participating as a musician and also in uh, conferences, seminars, and meetings about the role of culture in Latin America. And... Uh, in 1989, I decided to come back to the United States and began my doctorate at uh, UC San Diego, where I studied with uh, Herb Schiller, um, a renowned um, um, communication scholar, and did my work um, around music as a social force. So um, while I was a graduate student, uh, I have kids. So I was working uh, while I was a graduate student, while I was working on my doctorate, uh, I began working as a music producer for a record company here in Oakland and began producing records for them. And it, what a producer does is kind of a, uh, help the band with the arrangements and uh, getting the studio and supervising the session and the mixing and all these kinds of things. The experience I had had working in radio and began working in 
um, in the music business and meanwhile doing my dissertation research and you know uh, so uh, in 1995 I had a hit record that was uh, uh, it was three generations of Cuban musicians um, called Green Week Candela Rhythm at the Crossroads that was nominated for a Grammy and had significant sales so it was so i kind of rethought my career goals maybe i'll be a rock star instead of being a university professor um and uh began working uh more doing that and i produced another record right after that um that was also nominated for a grammy and i began working for warner brothers records uh where i, I got a call from a from a rock star named uh, David Byrne, who had a group called the Talking Heads. And he had a world music label, and he hired me to go to Peru to produce a, a, an artist named Susana Baca, who you saw in the Calle 13 video. Um, so I went in there and produced her record in, in Peru in uh, 1996 and began um, questioning my path at this point. Here I am, I got to Peru in the middle of a state of siege. Bombs are going off and, and police with machine guns and it was really a, uh, a crazy situation there. This was when the Shining Path guerrillas were active in, in, in Lima. And here I am recording this and, and they advertised, they interviewed me for one of the newspapers. Uh, Warner Brothers producer comes to Peru. And they're imagining me kind of like Donald Duck's uncle, right? The guy carrying a big sack of money, right? And I'm thinking, you know, this is not cool <laughs> uh, because I don't really work for Warner Brothers. I'm just a, a contractor hired for this one record being paid peanuts. Um, so, um, and then in the end, have, end up having a big fight with Warner Brothers and, and went back to, decided you know, I'm just going to teach and do records not with Warner Brothers, do it on my own. Um, so I began my own independent label and doing records that I wanted to do and just forget about the money I'm going to teach and began teaching at City College and uh, at UC Santa Cruz, where I still teach. I'm teaching a class right now, not now at this moment, but consecutively with this one. Um, and, uh, and at the uh, University of Wisconsin and several other places kind of sharing the experiences that I had in Latin America. And um, I continue uh, producing records and now I have eight Grammy nominations. Um, I'm on the Board of Governors of the Grammy, the Recording Academy, and I also teach master classes in music production at the Instituto Superior de, de, de Musica in Cuba, the High Institute of Music in Cuba, about music production. And, uh, and I produced over 100 CDs and I'm still involved in, in, uh, in teaching and in academic um, research about music. And I work with the Smithsonian Institution in Washington and several other institutions because some of my dissertation um, which is called Guitarra Armada, the role of music in the Nicaraguan Revolution, was um, turned out to be an important work because I was able to interview a lot of the musicians that, were, that participated in the Nicaraguan Revolution at a time when no one else could. Nobody else had access to these people, who many of them were, had been guerrilla fighters who wrote songs and, and used them as a form of passing on messages, et cetera. So a lot of this stuff turned out to be important research. So um, that's who I am. And uh, my father, again, um, made a lot of these films. And you'll see, um, I participated in a lot of the films that we're going to see. And, and uh, in The um, the Sixth Sun, The Mayan Uprising in Chiapas, uh, I'm the interviewer interviewing the Zapatistas and many of the people there, and you'll see me in some of the other videos. So any questions so far? And um, 
I've been teaching here at City College. I teach Diego Rivera Art and Social Change and Social Movements in Latin America. And I lead the study abroad trips to Cuba. We go, we go to Cuba every year. Yeah, City College, with City College students. And there's a scholarship available. And one of the prerequisites for the scholarship is that you take Latin American studies classes. So you, are, so you already qualify. And this qualifies as a Latin American studies class. So um, you already qualify. So uh, anyway, um, online people, any questions before we move on? Okay. I, I do have a question. Yeah. What made you get into Latin American studies and also, um, like, what made you want to get into music? I think that's really cool. I can't really hear you. It's buzzing. Can oh, you speak no, a little I, louder? Um, I said that <clears throat> what made you want to get into Latin American studies and also what made you want to produce music? Like, what, what inspired you to do music? Okay, well, I I visited Latin America um, first in the 1960s, I said, and um, began studying, uh, traveling. I, I also uh, went to Chile in 1970. My father made a film there about the election of Salvador Allende. I was in Chile during the election of Salvador Allende, uh, traveled a lot in Mexico. So I saw what was going on. And... Uh, and this inspired me to, to learn more about it. And the music, it was something, well, I studied music in Cuba, and this was very inspiring. I, I really liked, I, I was living in, growing up in San Francisco, I was inspired by the rock music that I heard, Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix and Jefferson Airplane and all this music that was around me. But um, I began playing, growing up in the Mission, uh, Mission High School had a very um, important music scene. and uh, Mission High School in the 70s was very disorganized. There was they were doing earthquake earthquake retrofitting, so the whole school was messed up. So mainly, what we did is bring our instruments to school and jam in Dolores Park, and and kind of teach each other whatever we knew, share with each other, and so uh, that's kind of what inspired me. So um, anyway, all right, uh huh. Yeah, I studied in in a school called the uh, Escuela Nacional de Arte, called La Ena, and this is a, a oh, his. It's an important school because it was built shortly after the revolution, and here's a small country with few resources building this like national art school, and putting huge resources. And the building itself is beautiful. It's in the shape of a woman's body. And it, it was built in what was a golf course, a country club. So we, I think I've seen like a photograph yeah, you've probably seen, pic right. So um, one of the things that the students did that we had to grow the food that we ate. So we plowed the golf course and in, in beautiful rows with corn here and this and that. So um, it was, uh, it, it was a beautiful, uh, beautiful place so um somebody just put something up on the screen here um so any more questions so let's talk a little bit about the course so one of the things we're going to look at in this course is we're going to go week by week looking at the situation of, of different countries and kind of the historical context so we're going to look you can see we're we're starting looking at the uh, the legacies of colonialism, and in the legacies of colonialism, we're going to look at how many of the things that were brought by the Spaniards or the impact of the the colonial governments, how they impacted Latin American countries and left lasting scars. That we'll see that many of the the aspects. Many of the, the things that happened 500 years ago still are having an impact. Can we think of one legacy of colonialism that still has a big impact? Racism in Cuba. Okay, we can see racism, and not just in Cuba. I mean, all over Latin America. Um, anything else? Right, so we can see indigenous groups still putting up a fight, the same battle being fought, uh, language, 
patriarchal system, um, many, many things, right, have, have had a lasting impact. The idea of dependency, right? We see that the, the colonial system created economic dependency and that still is having a huge impact on Latin America. So we're gonna see over and over. So what I'm gonna ask you, for instance, in these different sections is to try to give details. It's really easy to go off and say, oh, those Spaniards, you know, they, okay. But try to be specific, like, you know, try to give examples. Um, so the week two, week three, we're gonna look at Mexico. We're going to look at the Mexican Revolution and what happened. The, the, uh, a massive uprising and what happened, the taming of the revolution. How did that impulse, that revolutionary impulse that tore down many of the country's institutions, why wasn't it able to institutionalize in something that changed land ownership that, that erased many of the inequalities? So these are some of the things we're going to look at. How did this happen? Uh, Central America. We're going to look at um, the revolutionary movements in Central America and kind of the, the historical uh, legacies in, in Central America. Um, I'm going to try to get another film that's not on here now. I'm talking to the filmmakers about Rigoberta Menchu, a Guatemalan activist who won a Nobel Prize um, and an important documentary about her that, telling her story. Uh, we're going to spend uh, two weeks talking about Cuba. And we're going to view the film Fidel. That's a portrait of Fidel made in 1968. So this is Fidel himself. It's because one thing to read about him, what he said, and it's another thing to hear him say it. And it's a very interesting film made at that time and never shown in Cuba. Why? I think it'll be obvious when you see the film that he's pointing out, he said, look at these cows. These are going to be the future of Cuba. These cows will put one in every community and people have enough milk. All those cows died the next year uh, because they couldn't stand the heat. And, you know, a bunch of things like this. But again, you, what you'll see is his enthusiasm and his charisma. Because people say, oh, this dictator in this. Uh, but when you see the film, you say, okay, now I get it why he was so successful, that much of his enthusiasm was contagious. People were buying the, the dream that, that, he was, that he was selling, that he was offering, right? And you'll, you'll, you'll get that, you'll, you'll understand the context when you hear him talking about these things, right? So uh, what I've tried to do is include many documentary films each week that'll kind of give this firsthand look of, of as much as I could as the leaders speaking. Um, the Andes, this is um, an important section, especially with what's going on in Bolivia and Ecuador today, uh, looking at um, the, the, the movements, um, the role of the extraction of raw materials and the impact that that has. So here we'll have the midterm. So we'll have midterm review, right? We'll have a conference like this. And we'll review the questions and we'll look where might you, what would be a strategy for answering these questions, right? Okay. And there's some midterm review materials. Then we're going to talk about Colombia, uh, Venezuela. And this is again, oops, how'd this get in here? Something happened to the dates here. Am I looking at the right one? Were yeah, somehow the dates got changed. Um, I'll fix the dates. But anyway, because I re I set this and and they it got re looks like the dates got reset because I had to have this set up. So anyway, I'll fix that. But anyway. Uh, you get the idea. Uh huh. After the midterm, is it yeah. multiple choice or is it essays? They're essays. Every they're all essay okay. questions. There's no multiple choice. So um, we're then we're talking about Argentina, Chile, Brazil. 
and then the final that kind of brings it all together. So the main things we're going to do, we're going to, you're going to be writing essays, two page essays. There's going to be a midterm, a five page research paper. And this five page research paper is going to be about anything that you want, whatever, in, what interests you within the course. So um, one of the questions on the midterm is what's the topic of your research paper? So the, the point of that question is for me to give you feedback. So I can give you feedback. If you say, okay, I'm going to study the impact of, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I'm going to say, yeah, that's good. Or the, you could say the, the impact of taco trucks on San Francisco, you know. Okay, well, if you can justify it, then, then that's fine. So are, are we clear? Any questions out there? Can we bring our notes to the midterm and final? Yeah, because you're doing it at home. <laughs> you can bring all the notes you want um, because you're, you're at home in your pajamas uh, doing this. And you can ask your chihuahua for help if you want um, because um, it'll just be you out there. Um, so um, where did I get the shirt? <laughs> <laughs> Can't tell you that. Um, so, uh, no, it's uh, Desigual from Spain. Uh, what was I going to tell you? Okay, so for the research paper, one more tidbit, and this is listed on there. What I'm going to ask you to do to make this more fun is if you can find a primary source. I'm encouraging you to try to find a primary source. Now, what is a primary source? What's the difference between a primary source and a secondary? A primary source is usually uh, a speech. But in the history of, of what does Avni do, a primary source? The, hi coming from him, the history of what? Well, oh, Zavni, yeah. 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 So the thing is, it's someone you talk to or an artifact, right, that you come, personal contact. So this makes you the historian. Instead of interpreting someone else's work or using their interpretation of interviews, I'm gonna ask you to do this. So how would you do that? How would you find a primary source to talk about something in Latin America? Okay, someone said a family or friend. Yeah, that would be obvious, right? Let's say you wanted to talk about issues of immigration. So you interview someone who's an immigrant, maybe a family member or a friend, or um, you want to talk about Cuba. You could find people all over the place who would be happy to talk to you about it. Now, what's interesting about this is you're going to find that the personal interviews are almost surely going to contradict everything in this book, right? Because the, the, the personal narratives, people are experiencing this on a firsthand level, you know. And, uh, you know, you'll hear these personal stories and you can contrast it to the official stories, to the official text and kind of put it in context. Why are these stories so different? And I've read hundreds of these and, and they're really, it's interesting for me to read that you're someone who's talking about um, drug violence in Mexico. And, you know, the personal narratives, well, I didn't think it was too bad because, you know, the drug lords built a hospital and a school and this and that. But then they killed my cousin and then I had to leave. And, you know, so these kinds of stories. Uh, can it be my own? The problem with your own, then you're, you have a dilemma. Uh, you have a, a social science dilemma is then it's a participant observer. How do you explain yourself? Like, let's say you interview somebody, you have to explain why is this person's story relevant, right? Why do we care about this? But with yourself, then you would have to explain why your story is relevant. So you can look into it. Yes, you can, but it's probably not a good idea. Um, it's probably not a good idea. It's better to, to, to interview somebody else. Um, somebody close to you, um, 
So, because again, once you, you get in the participant observer, you again have to get past your own bias. Because you're gonna wanna analyze this person's story in a, in a more um, neutral setting, to kind of put their story against the historical text and references, right? Is that clear? So in the midterm, I'm gonna ask you what your topic is and then I'll help you. Because I've read many of these, I could give you sources, maybe look here, look there, narrow it down, maybe look at this aspect or something you didn't know about. So it, I can help give you uh, some, some references. So um, anything else anybody wants to cover, talk about? This is your, your chance here. So I really want you to succeed in the class. I really want you to do well. And I'm going to give you all the opportunities to do that. Again, I, I said earlier, people, someone asked about late papers. Late papers are not allowed, but if you ask for an extension, I'll give it to you. So I hope you understand the distinction, right? Um, so that, um, you know, I want to be flexible. If, you if you're having trouble with your writing, you can talk to me, you know, or you, you realize you made a, a big mistake. Uh, but what I'm asking you to do is also be respectful and try to edit your work, to, to proofread it so that I can read it. Uh, so I'm not grading you on your grammar, but I'm just grading you on the content of what you're saying. Um, if you're having trouble with English, um, you know, try to, to find a tutor or some help to, to write it out. And um, the City College Canvas system has an anti-plagiarism detector built in called uh, Verisite, a new one, which is way more sensitive. So if you cutting and pasting from Wikipedia, it's going to start blinking red. So don't go there. And I'm going to tell you, like, excuse me, do you see the blinking red light? Uh, you know, don't do this. Um, so um, try to, you know, use original work, and you don't really need to do that. And most people that do that end up with the wrong information anyway. I mean, or the... the the answers to these questions aren't on Wikipedia. So, um, questions, comments, anybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, the Dancing with Dynamite's online. It's an ebook. It's seven dollars online. And again, I said before um, that it goes on sale sometimes, and and. Uh, so, and, and that's a very easy to read book, but you'll find that it's an interesting, a refreshing contrast where this book is kind of a, a written in, in a very dense historical way that this is not like Bart reading. This is double cappuccino type reading where you want to kind of really concentrate, not kind of before bedtime reading. Uh, the other book are more anecdotes and stories. It's a lot easier um, told, told in an anecdotal way. Um, and it's a contrast. You'll find that his description is very different than the descriptions in, in this other modern Latin America. And a lot of the articles and videos are also going to be contrasting viewpoints. So any, any uh, comments, um, comments out there in uh, Internet land? Yeah, it's listed on the, the schedule. And I'll fix the dates. Something happened here with, with Canvas and it reset all my yeah. dates. So you read it you read it in pieces. Um, the book is about this this thick, not very thick. Uh, the the articles are maybe eight or ten pages long and they're very easy to read. It's written he's a journalist and he's kind of very enthusiastic and, and you it kind of comes through the 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 pages, his enthusiasm about these things. And I always, I, I can tell people that, that read that book because in their essays, the enthusiasm comes through, right? Where a lot of people are going, oh, Hugo Chavez is a dictator and blah, blah, blah. They probably didn't read his book where he's talking about the, the, the positive things that Hugo Chavez did and kind of downplaying the negative. 
So um, there's both. These guys are real hard on, on Hugo Chavez, but um, the Dancing with Dynamite. Um, why? Because he was there. You know, he was there. And he was in the parties and he was feeling the enthusiasm and it was very different. Um, and somebody who's sitting in their office in Harvard looking south, right? Going, well, you know, I think the blah, blah, blah. And it's different. Somebody who's actually there experiencing it and feeling it and in the, in the process. And, and, you know, so that's why I put it. And we'll see a lot of the different documentaries. Um, the different documentaries also give you a feeling of like what it's like. So during the semester, as soon as I can, as a, when I find things, I'll be putting them up there too. So um, anything else? Anybody have any other comments, questions? So um, the possibility of doing well in this class is very strong. You just have to put in the time and the effort and be conscientious. If you miss an assignment, I'm going to be reminding you. I have a little button here. Remind students who missed assignments. So like the day after the assignment, if you forgot, you're going to get a little reminder. Hey, what happened? You know, get, get going. Um, and don't take it personally. It's, it's just a, a way of, of helping you stay on track. Okay? Mm -hmm. She's asking if I do extra credit. Nego it's negotiable. <laughs> Let's say it's negotiable. Um, that everything is negotiable. Uh, if you're willing to put in the effort, then it's all negotiable. Okay. So I want you to do well. You're taking an online class. I realize because you're busy, because you got other stuff going on and you can't be here and you can't be in a. You probably people wouldn't subject themselves to this if they had a choice, uh, or maybe, I don't know. But um, usually people have other things going on in their life and need to need this space and, and are prepared to, to do what they need to do, to carve out a space to be able to do this. And that's what I do to, to, to grade the papers and to deal with the class. I carve out a time and that's what I do is I just sit there and I do that and then I'm done. And then the next day I do that. So I'm, I'm very accessible to you and uh, I wanna make this work. Also, um, my other class um, has field trips and you're welcome to come along. I'll let you know when we do it. Um, my Diego Rivera class, we go to the Day of the Dead Festival that you mentioned, which is on a Saturday this year. So what's cool about it is to go to the Day of the Dead Festival by yourself I don't know, not so much fun. But to go with a big posse of city college students, lots of fun. So um, we usually go to the Mission Cultural Center and go look at the altars, talk to the artists, have a little discussion with, with some of the people there. And then uh, later on, there's, uh, we go to Garfield Park and there's um, the altars there that people build for their family and, and loved ones. And then there's a procession. And so that's what we do. and um, there's, uh, I don't know, like 50 people in this class and, and 100 in my Diego Rivera class. So we might have a strong contingent. And uh, it's, been, it's been fun. Because you meet other students and you meet other people and you have to share something in common that you're studying this together. So it's, it's a fun activity. And then you can write about it. You know, the, a lot of people write their research papers about it. About the, I'll let you know. I know it's November 2nd. That's not going to change. And what time we meet and where, that, that we'll figure it out. Usually we meet like around 5 o'clock. It's a Saturday, and it's not an official field trip. It's not mandatory. It's completely optional. And if you just want to check in and say hi and then go off. But um, usually it's, it's a lot of fun. November 2nd. Um, so, um, anything else? Okay, uh, so online people, you can sign off, just say goodbye, or if you have any more questions, uh, then, then go on. And I'll send the um, extra, extra, um, 
uh, if you have anything else to say. Okay, thanks for coming out and um, I'll be seeing you through this. Yeah, and if you wanna go to Cuba, um, contact the study abroad office here and tell them that you're interested and then she'll harass you relentlessly. Okay, yeah, because yeah. oh, I read that I guess one of the requirements is to go to see them and you can go anywhere and, and like, like a, a is that how it works? What do you mean? I was reading the descriptions and it says that um, you can study anywhere, but first you have to do a summer. Is mm -hmm. that wrong or is that right information? Mm -hmm. Or is no. it only in Cuba? No, they have them. They have study abroad all over the place. Well, that's what I'm saying. But for the program here, you'd have to attend a summer with the I don't think you so. Go to. No, no. So I looked at it online. No. Well, you can talk to her, but a lot of people go to the Cuba trip just just to go. Yeah. Yeah, it's because um, I just got a house in Nicaragua, and my, um, 